Uh, typically pretty early stage, uh, especially from here, yeah. From here it's, it's, th uh, it's seed and series A typically. Um, yeah, so we're, we're looking at them pre in pretty early stage for, for two reasons. One is um, because they're more hungry, so you know, they have more interest in, in talking with, with us. Um, two, because uh, it gives us an edge, because by the time they're at series B and C, everybody knows about them. So, it's, it's better to get in early and, and, and you know, give us an exclusivity. Um, and also, frankly, because they are, it was a whole lot cheaper to invest at that stage. So yes, it's riskier, but it's also a whole lot cheaper. So in fact, when I was talking to our strategy group when we set it up, um, I asked them the same question. I'm like, what stage are you looking for? And they said, well, roughly C or D, because it takes them just as much effort to invest $100 million says it takes them to invest $1 million. But we brought them a whole bunch of companies that were you know, seed or series A that were so strategic that we've made very early stage investments in them uh, because it was, you know, we saw the, the, the path being very strategic. Of course, the, there are risks in doing that. A, the, the company may, may fold, uh, it may go in a different direction. Um, the next day, there may be another competitor that comes along that's even better, and you know, psychologically, people would want to work with the company that they invested in. It's very hard to convince them that that's sunk cost, and you just need to look forward and you know, don't worry about that investment. You know, it's even VCs have uh, have a pretty bad track record. You know, only 10% of the companies really make it. So getting that mentality in, that's I think is going to be a bit harder. Um, especially when the, the concept of failure, it's viewed very differently there than in Silicon Valley. So here it's almost a badge of honor or at least you, you learn from your, from your failures and it's treated differently. When, when you talk about failure in, in, in Dearborn, you, you talk about a recall, you talk about you know, wheels falling off. So they, they, they think very differently about that. And that's what we're trying to change is that it's okay in a, in a research environment to fail. It's okay to, to look at technologies that may never make it. But the other thing that I think is really important is by having this very broad view is you may decide today that you know, a technology is not needed or is not worth it or some team you know, is not ready. But a year from now, when someone comes to, you, to us with a problem, we can always go like, oh yeah, there was a company we talked to a year ago that had this technology or things have changed, let's go talk to those guys again or um, you know, all of a sudden they, they changed direction and now we like them. So it's, it's very important to, to maintain that relationship to, to know what's there. My, my, my biggest fear is that you know, some other car company finds some technology that I'm not aware of and they put it in their cars and they announce it and, and we didn't even know about it. If, if we knew about it and we decided that not to pursue it because of one reason or another that we knew at the time, I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm not okay with seeing it in someone else's car and we didn't even know about it. So yeah, the issue has not been resolved yet. Um, so we're still looking at, at regulations, we're still looking at the legal implications, at, at the insurance implications. 
from a technical point of view, we're looking at this concept of ethical programming. So it's not really on the car itself is not ethical because it's a thing. Yeah. So it's the people behind the program it they need to program it ethically. And the thinking right now is basically look, we have this set of rules that we as a society agree with. This is what we we've implemented. You know, it's we, we can open the set of of instructions or rules to to everybody to, to understand what's going on. Understand that as a whole, as a society, we will have fewer deaths. And as a society, we need to come together and accept that risk will never be exactly zero, but that we're going to reduce the risk a lot. And the risk that we, we accept, I mean, today we, we accept a risk of killing 30,000 people each year in, in the US in order to have mobility, in order to go to work, in order to travel and enjoy this. Um, so we we've made this unwritten pact with each other that it's okay to kill 30,000 people to, in order to, to move the economy. Otherwise, we can make everybody drive 20 miles an hour and you still have mobility, but, and you'll probably still kill you know, 1,000 people a year anyway. So we, we have this unwritten agreement. Um, the idea with autonomous vehicles would be that it's more, more of a set of rules that people are, are aware of that it's discussed and it's an ethical set of rules that we, we all agree on. But it's not, it's not a solved issue as of today. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's an excellent point because that's, that's what happened to us at, at BMW. And because BMW was only the, the second car company here, we didn't have a precedent. So we were trying to figure out our place and we kind of got bounced around a lot in the, the first couple of years until we figure out where exactly we belong and what technology we're going to deal with. And, and I'm still seeing that pendulum swing like when when I was there, we were a bit more diversified. Now it seems that I'm like focusing mostly on apps. Um, at least that's what I'm seeing from the outside. So, and, and they may still move along the way. Um, that's why we made this conscious decision of, of having this portfolio to, to make sure we have a bit of everything to, that, so that we, we maintain a nice, nice balance. Um, that doesn't mean that we're not gonna get bounced around a bit until you know, we've find out exactly where, where we belong. Um, and, and yeah, you have to deal with, you know, it just, just the fact that we are the shiny toy on the block, clearly it makes some people jealous, right? So it, you, you need to, to handle that carefully. And at the same time, you find people who are really open-minded and they love to work with us. And, and that in itself, to some extent, may push us in one direction or another. Um, but no, I, honestly, the, there are actually quite a bit of bruises that Ford had from what the late 90s when they did make some weird acquisitions that didn't pan out well. And that's why for a while we didn't make any acquisitions at all. Um, so this is somewhat new or, or let's say for the newer generation, it's a, it's a new endeavor. Um, and we'll see, how, we'll see how it works out. Um, I mean, to me, a measure of success right now is just that People within Ford want to work with us and we have interesting projects. To me, the real, you know, real metric is how many things I'm going to see in cars that came from our office. But in order to do that, we need at least probably five years before we have something where I can go in a car and go like, you know, that's mine. Although then again, we work with software, so it'd be hard to go, that's mine. Yeah. 